Nice to have you here. So my interest in theater began about 30 years ago when I first stepped foot on, on the stages of a number of theater companies on the Cape. And that was including Monomoy Theater in Chatham, which is one of our classic theaters on, on Cape Cod. And then the Chatham Drama Guild and the Harwich Junior Theater, which is now the Cape Cod Theater Company and the Cape Cod Community College Players. And I felt at the very beginning that it was a transformative experience, that it, it was magical. You leave your problems and, and today behind and you get on stage and you're a different character in a different story. And it just from the beginning felt magical to me. So because I'm a writer at heart, I wanted to write about that experience. And so I was lucky enough to begin doing uh, articles about theater and theater personalities and theater history and theater reviews for the Cape Cod Times. And I did that for about 10 years, a blissful, I might say, 10 years. It was just lovely. And then uh, life changes began to happen and I went away to college and got married and had children and moved all around for a number of years. So really I was off Cape for a few decades and, um, and then I returned because that's what people do. <laughs> there is something about Cape Cod that is infectious. It's, it's just magical. So I uh, came back to the Cape and like so many people who do, including at the turn of the 20th century, at the end of the, the 19th century and the 20th century, there were people coming to the Cape for just that magical feeling. And there were writers and playwrights and visual artists who came to artist colonies in Provincetown and another very early artist colony that you don't hear about too often, which was on the Isle of Nantucket. Nantucket. And that actually began in the 1890s. So, um, so that, that was happening to so many um, artists. And in fact, they were coming by train toward the Cape and then wended their way to, to Provincetown. And so these uh, theater communities, these artist communities began to grow and spread all over the Cape. But I'm gonna show you a video that, that goes into all of that in, in some detail. So back to my history. So I came back to the Cape and was lucky enough to begin doing reviews and theater articles again for the Cape Cod Times. And what I realized was, oh, somebody wants to be admitted, I'll admit yeah. them. So <laughs> what I realized was that the theater community had grown and thrived while I was gone and was, was really healthy. And there were so many theater companies and so many choices. So I wanted to write about that. And I wanted to do a comprehensive panorama of uh, theater history on the Cape. So that's when I started out to do the book. And really nobody has done that since Evelyn Lawson, who wrote uh, a book in the early 1960s uh, uh, entitled Theater on Cape Cod. And she was a well-known um, art critic uh, reviewer on the Cape for the Cape Cod Times, then the Standard Times. And she actually, in fact, every year had her own awards presentation for the, the theater culture. So I actually used her, her book, it became my Bible as, so I'm grateful to her. So I expect that she's sitting in the back row of a theater while I'm reviewing with her little pad out making notes. And, and those are the little thoughts that I have in my head. So, um, so I set out to write the book and it's the way that it's structured is that I begin in Provincetown, which really is, is where it all began. So for our purposes, Land's End is really Land's beginning. 
And what I hope I've done with this book is to show people, people who come from, from off Cape, that not only can they soak in our sun, but they can also bask in this magical light of theater on the Cape. So now I, I have a video that, um, that I'd like to show you. So I'm gonna just get the screen up and this really goes into the early history of theater on the Cape in some detail. And is there anyone else in the waiting room, by the way? Um, I don't see anybody else. Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. Yeah. Yeah. They might trickle. Okay. And so here we go. It's a summer's eve on Cape Cod, and everywhere there are the sounds of waves lapping against the shore, gulls crying out, and children laughing and chattering as they play an endless game of tag with the waves. But there are also other sounds. There's the soaring sound of an orchestra tuning up, and the sound of laughter at perfectly played physical comedy, and then dramatic lines hitting the air like a knife blade. Those are the sounds of summer theater on Cape Cod. Every summer and increasingly into the fall season, people come from all over the world to see New York quality theater on Cape Cod without the hustle and bustle and heat and grit and grime of the city. They're treated to world-class theater. In fact, according to the Cape Cod Theater Coalition, 600,000 people actually view performances in a normal summer on Cape Cod. Now, unfortunately, this past summer has not been what we would call an average summer on the Cape. Unfortunately, the theaters have been darkened, but theaters have continued through the pandemic to produce virtual productions and performances and acting classes all through the summer and have continued so into the fall. So what is it about theater on Cape Cod that makes it world quality? And one of the things is fierce competition. There are actually more than three dozen theater companies and that number is continuing to increase every year. So three dozen theater companies across the small spit of land and the islands on Cape Cod. But there's something more. There's a long standing tradition of theater on the Cape that goes back more than a hundred years. In fact, it all began in what was once a sleepy little fishing village called Provincetown, which became a mecca for artists and writers and playwrights performers, and to this day is still a mecca for artists of, of every description. And that theater tradition traveled across the Cape, up and down and into the islands. So let's look at where it all began, and that's at the land's end. Or for our purposes, we might say the land's beginning. So at the beginning of the 20th century, there was really a revolution in all of the arts and all around the world. There were writers like Henry David Thoreau and Henry James, and then visual artists like Monet and Manet, and of course Pablo Picasso in Europe, who were breaking new ground. And what they wanted to do was to break free of the strictures of European style theater and, and the arts and literature and create something that was uniquely modern. And in Provincetown, there was an artist, Charles Webster Hawthorne, who in fact had a school for artists, and he was teaching a technique called en plein air. Now, as the name sort of tells you, it, it was exactly what it says. It was teaching artists to create the natural world, to translate the natural world in a natural way to canvas. And that was attracting beginning with visual artists, was bringing in visual artists from places like Boston and New York, where they would hop on a train and then eventually wend their way to the 
forming artist colony in Provincetown. And in fact, by 1916, the Boston Globe had printed a headline that said, world's greatest and biggest artist colony in Provincetown. And playwrights were making their way to this colony as well. One of them was Susan Glass Bell, who was a well-known playwright in her time. And she was actually convincing other artists and performers and playwrights to make their way to the art colony in Provincetown. And one of those was Eugene O'Neill. And he was a fledgling playwright at the time. And if you know anything about theater history, then that's the name that should jump out on you. Because without exaggeration, Eugene O'Neill was responsible for transforming American drama into a truly American art form. In fact, in a little play called Bound East for Cardiff, which was produced on, for the first time, was staged in a little rickety fishing house that was transformed into a little, <clears throat> in a little theater in a wharf on, in P-Town. And that was on July 28th in 1916. And that was really the beginning. That and other works of his that followed were the very beginning of American drama as we know it today. He created characters that were uniquely American. In fact, his lead character in Bound East was Yank and dealt with subjects that were uniquely American, like class issues that weren't being dealt with in other places at that time. So through that summer of 1916, the uh, little vanguard of playwrights continued to produce works, avant-garde works of their own and to perform in one another's plays and, and direct one another's plays. So it became this thriving art community, artist community uh, in Provincetown. Then by the fall, uh, they decided to take their success and go to Gotham with it. So they went to New York, which they thought was going to be just one season. And actually, it turned out to be seven seasons that they were in New York. And they inhabited a theater um, that was originally called the Playwrights Theater, and then uh, became known as the Provincetown Playhouse, obviously as a nod to their beginnings oh, okay. in oh. Provincetown. So yeah. during that time, however, they were going back and forth between New York and, and Provincetown and continue to, to act in, in, um, in productions on the war. Yeah, Fortunately, though, in 1917, the Little Wharf Theater burned down, and by 1922 had been swept away by a fierce storm into the sea. But that didn't mean that theater was done in Provincetown. In fact, the activity moved to the west side of P-Town to a barn uh, of all places for a theater. Frank Shea, who was a bookseller and a fledgling playwright in his own right, actually opened his barn on the west side of Provincetown. And his troop of players became known as the Barnstormers. And in fact, the Provincetown players uh, also acted with Frank in the barn. And over time, a uh, couple of factions actually formed of the Barnstormers. There was one that was dedicated to the avant-garde works of people like O'Neill and Glassfell and Edna St. Vincent Millay. But at the same time, there was another faction that was sort of stuck in tradition. And this was kind of uh, led by an actress named Mary Bicknell, who uh, eventually formed her own group of players called the Wharf Players. And they uh, took residence in 
a, a, a little war theater again, which was a, sort of the second iteration of the war theaters in Provincetown. So this was at 83 Commercial Street, but there's a little piece of theater trivia that's, that's sort of interesting here. There was no love lost between these two factions. And in fact, theater trivia tells us that the new war players left, left absconded with theater benches and props to prove their disdain for the barnstormers before they uh, they inhabited their war theater. So, but but that sort of takes us away from the very early years. That that was probably into the 1930s, and there was also very early activity going on in other areas of Cape Cod. For example, on the Isle of Nantucket. There was an actor's colony that formed in the town of Seaconset, and this was known as the Sconset Actors Colony. And they were actually, it was actually made up of people who had long traditions. Uh, they were members of families that had long traditions in theater. And like the group in Provincetown, they were also looking for a place where they could see what their own pens could do and their own performances could do. So they began by performing in various locales around Sconset and then created a really expansive artist colony, uh, which in fact included a tennis court and a bowling alley. And then eventually they created what was called the Sconset Casino, which offered them a lot of space, uh, a lot of room for big productions and for bigger audiences. So they were able to create some, some really um, spectacular productions at that time. And it's important to know that they were actually the seed for a group that continues to this day in Provincetown uh, in Nantucket. The Theater Workshop of Nantucket actually continues to produce everything from light comedy to serious drama and um, have a long and continuing history on the island. So uh, again, there were other areas and a, another was Falmouth. If you take a short hop back across Nantucket Sound to the town of Falmouth, then there was a group that formed in the early 20s called the University Players. And the University Players, as their name implies, was made up of students from Harvard and Princeton and Radcliffe, and then a number of other universities cities and colleges in the area. And that actually became home to a number of soon to be luminaries, including Henry Fonda and Margaret Sullivan and the noted Broadway and film producer Joshua Logan. And in fact, in his autobiography, Joshua Logan talks about his starving artist days in West Falmouth and what that meant to him as he uh, continued in his career. And he said that not only were they totally dedicated to their art, but they were also completely dedicated to each other. And that kind of dedication actually enabled them to create some spectacular productions. They, in fact, created a, a, a production of and all that jazz that uh, for all the world looks like a Busby per Berkeley production. So, and, and this was a group of university students that did this. Sadly, they unfortunately disbanded after a few years, but that certainly didn't mean that theater history was done either on Cape Cod or in Falmouth. In fact, if there was an early jewel in the crown of theater on Cape Cod, and that was the Falmouth Playhouse. And this was a magnificent structure that 
sat on the banks of the Kunameset Lake. And in fact, it included not only a huge theater that, believe it or not, back in the 20s and 30s had a form of air conditioning, but uh, it also had a restaurant and nightclub that overlooked the lake and a, an oval-shaped European-style bar. And this became home to a number of, of uh, stage and screen stars at the time, too, including Tallulah Bankhead and Helen Hayes and Gertrude Lawrence, who we'll talk a little bit about in a minute, but she actually became the wife of Richard Aldrich, who at um, a point in the 1930s took over the, the running of the Falmouth Playhouse along with a number of other theaters on Cape Cod. But, um, but it was a magnificent structure and um, again was home to so many stars. And that actually became uh, a trademark for Richard Aldridge in his star machine that he brought to all four of the theaters that he owned and managed at one time. But again, we're getting a, sort of ahead of ourselves here. So I want to get back to some really early theater history. So uh, the Cape Playhouse, which is the oldest continually operating summer theater in America. And this is in Dennis on 6A, which is the old King's Highway in Cape Cod. And the Cape Playhouse was actually the brainchild of Raymond Moore, who was one of the Provincetown players. And this is sort of a theme in Cape Cod theater that again and again, the same names crop up because of the expansive and ever growing theater culture. People sort of move from theater to theater and it's continued to this day really that an actor might find a play that appeals to him in Provincetown and then the next week be in a play at the Cape Cod Theater Company in Harwich. So this is sort of a theme of Cape Cod Theater. So Moore uh, was acting with the Provincetown players and with the Barnstormers and uh, tried his hand at playwriting as well. But he decided that he wanted to start a theater in the commercial and business area of the Cape, so in the Mid-Cape area. So he began looking around in Yarmouth and, and Dennis and then um, sort of really focused on Dennis and actually found a building, the Nubscusset Meeting House, which was 200 years old, which he bought for the princely sum of $200. And then found a parcel of land, a three acre parcel off of 6A, off of the Old Kings Highway and um, had the Nubscusset Meeting House move there. And apparently this is something that, that happened more regularly around the turn of the centuries and, and into the, the teens and the twenties that buildings were moved. So he found this parcel of land and by 1927, he was ready to open the Cape Playhouse. And um, the first season, in fact, featured a performance by Basil Rathbone. And then the next season featured a performance by a newcomer, Henry Fonda, and another newcomer who actually got her start as an usher at the Cape Playhouse, and then got a little part in a play called Mr. Kim Stops By. Now that play will forever fall into obscurity, but the name of Betty Davis will stay with us forever. So um, that, that was a tradition that began bringing in stars to the Cape Playhouse. And, um, but Moore had more on his mind than just a single theater. He wanted to create an art colony. And so he began using the buildings and the property. One was a junior, became a junior theater. And then one was, was a building for storing 
props and, and staging. And then another building became the Cape Cinema. Now, the Cape Cinema is still noted around the world for its classic feel and for its attention to classic films and to new avant-garde and foreign films. But it's also noted for a fabulous ceiling mural that was produced by artist Rockwell Kent. And so the cinema opened in 1930 and in fact was the site of the world debut of The Wizard of Oz. So unfortunately, by the 1930s, Moore was beginning to fail both physically and financially. And so he turned over his uh, the, the management of the Cape Playhouse to Richard Aldrich, who was at that time the uh, producing manager of the theater and eventually became its owner and then eventually owned four theaters, as, as we said, the Falmouth Playhouse and the uh, Cape Music Circus, which became the Melody Tent, and then the South Shore Music Circus. And in all of those areas, he brought real star power. And again, as I said, that's continued in the Cape Playhouse, which continues to, to bring in luminaries every year. So as I said, also Gertrude Lawrence was Mrs. A, how she was known lovingly around the Cape. And she was uh, absolutely a, a force in the arts culture on the Cape and, and in the community around her. And in fact, there is a theater in the Dennis Union Church that bears her name, the Gertrude Lawrence Theater. So that's it. That's the dramatic early history of theater on Cape Cod, beginning in a sleepy little fishing village in Provincetown and creating an unbroken line of evolution that has transferred along the Cape and continues to this day. And as I said earlier, it has been kind of a hard time for theaters on the Cape. They were darkened, but they have continued to produce performances and presentations and classes virtually, and they'll be ready to take to the stage when it's time, because after all, the show must go on. Okay. Oh, that was great. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank if, you. If anyone wants to ask any questions, they can yeah, please feel free or raise their hands. It's not a question, it's a comment. That I'm astonished at your knowledge. It, this was just fabulous. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was such a joy to, uh, to do the research around this. I just have to say that I always tell this story of sitting at my computer at seven in the morning while I was writing this and then uh, realizing it was getting dark, that it was like seven or eight at night and I hadn't moved and my poor cat hadn't been fed and <laughs> terrible things were happening, but I was so engrossed in it. And the research was such a joy. The theater community across the Cape just really responded fabulously. Someone's asking a question. What do you know about a small theater in Woods Hole near Gansett? Well, there's the Woods Hole um, Community Theater. I don't know if that's, if that's it. And they perform in the uh, community center in Woods Hole. Um, I don't know if that's the group that you mean, but they, they're still performing. They perform. No, this, goes, this goes way back to the time of early Henry Fonda. Oh, okay. Then and I, it, was I, a, it was a small theater. It, my mother had friends who owned the house that had been the theater. Um, it, oh. it burnt down, but it was, it was there for a long time. Um, I think it's on Gansett Road. I'm not quite sure. Oh, okay. But it had a balcony and they, people would perform and others would sit in the yard and watch, but it had luminaries there, maybe early in their careers, but there were luminaries. 
Oh, that was interesting. So, so that would have been around the 20s or 30s? I guess. I don't know for sure. Yeah, interesting. I'll have, I'll have to check that out. Okay. I don't know. So, someone else, um, Ruthie, we were, uh, oh, okay. So, um, so someone wanted information about the book. It's actually going to be uh, published for full release on May 17th. But uh, in the meantime, uh, it's available for pre-orders on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Goodreads. And you can also get an advanced copy, an actual hard copy. And I'm gonna give you an email address if, um, if, everybody's, if anybody's interested. And uh, it's my salesperson who's sending out advanced copies to participants. Of, of these shows and the email address is C, letter C, and then B E A R S C H at Arcadia Publishing.com. So if you wanted to to get one for a Christmas gift or something. <laughs> um, oh thank you, Sue. <laughs> thank you for doing that. Someone also yeah. posted a question and I, I, I didn't see it before the next one came on. So was there someone whose question I didn't answer? Yeah, I think someone had asked about recording because she came late and we are recording and assuming it records correctly, what we, what we will do is put it on our YouTube and then put links to it from Facebook and Twitter as well. I mean, it might take a few days oh, okay. to get it up. Oh, okay. So I can get it on YouTube and Facebook. Yeah, as soon as yeah, as, we do have a YouTube channel, so you can either go to that what, or what's it called? If you follow our, fa um, I'm sorry. What's the YouTube channel called? It's just Falmouth Public Library. Oh, okay. We just got it back up, and it's only got a few things. So watch for that in the next few days. And also, once we have it up, we will absolutely link to that on Facebook and Twitter too, to let you know people who follow us on Facebook and Twitter know that it's. I thought too. I ran home. I thought it started at two thirty, and I, I missed. I'm so sorry. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm really glad I'm going to get to see it. So that's good. Yes, absolutely. Great. Okay. Great. Okay. Yes, and. Yeah, that, thanks everyone for coming again. I'm so pleased that so many people came out, especially on a fairly nice Saturday. Yeah, that was afternoon. wonderful. So that's great. That was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm actually, and I I happen to live down Cape Moore, so I've been to I've been to that theater and I've been to the cinema, and it's amazing. It's an amazing experience. I would recommend. It's worth the drive from Falmouth to go there. So this is someone from Clyde. The university players actually started in Woods Hole. Oh, okay. And and performed, where was it you were saying, Clyde? Clyde, where, can you answer? What? I didn't see the end of that comment. Oh, okay. They, uh, this is from a book uh, about them, the, the title of which I don't remember. It was written by a guy named Houghton. Yeah, it was written by a guy who was in the company. And they started in Woods Hole. They did their very early sh shows in the old Elizabeth Theater in Falmouth, which was became a movie house. That's right. I remember that. Now that you say that, right. Some right. of them at least lived in Woods Hole and some crane estate. One of them had connections to the cranes and there was some crane money involved. In right. The so oh, the person that was thinking about the Woods Hole might be thinking of that group in the extremely early days of it. Oh, no, it wasn't on the Crane Estate. I mean, because that's on Juniper Point. Yeah, it was in another spot in Woods Hole. But it, it that's may all have I been know the about same it. People, so. Maybe, maybe. Because they, they bounced around a little bit, but then they built their own place, the, the place they had in North Town, but they built themselves. From right. The photographs. It looked a little rickety. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Most of them were rickety at that at yeah. that point. Yeah, rickety. <laughs> Before there were serious building codes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. The the cranes were incredible um, philanthropists in terms of the the theater community. They also um, were very active in in funding the Gilbert and Sullivan Players, which eventually became the College Light Opera Company yeah. in Falmouth. So so it seems as though they they were a huge um, force in theater and Falmouth and theater funding.
So any other questions? One other little comment. I noticed that the university players said it was in West Falmouth and it's actually now in North Falmouth and there's a, a, an ongoing question of where the boundary actually was. So it was sort of where Old Silver Beach was, was North Falmouth-ish, West Falmouth-ish. <laughs> And they don't oh. really know where the line is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Um, Dick Jones, who was involved with the Book of Falmouth, and he also was very involved with theater, I think the university players, mm -hmm. he said that uh, Jimmy Stewart was among them. So, he was. He was. Uh, yeah, I didn't mention that on the video, but, but that okay. was another one of the names. There was actually a, a whole long list of, of people who um, talks about Summerstock on Cape Cod in his book, oh. My Life. Yeah, um, there, there was actually a whole list of people who got their starts with the university players. Uh, among them, uh, uh, I forget the name now, but a, a noted uh, life photographer, photographer for Life magazine, as well as a number of other actors. And I think, and someone just sent a column, I, I mean, a, a comment saying that Henry Stewart writes about the university players in his biography, My Life. Henry Fonda, I mean. Yeah. Hello. I'd like to give a plug to the Cape Cod Theater Project. They Great. Do, they, yeah, they do staged readings and they bring in actors that are on Broadway, off Broadway. But, you know, and some of them have been, uh, have been, you know, major stars as well. Yep. Um, and I mentioned them in my book. Yep. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. And they're able to uh, Zoom all of their productions this summer. So oh, that's wonderful. Down in yeah. Texas. I wish I was up there. So it was a little <laughs> bit at home, you know, even though they were all New Yorkers. But yeah, anyway, that's I, another, good, another good spot. Yes. Yeah. Curious, Sue, did you happen to mention um, when in your book, uh, Theater on the Bay, where Edward Gorey had many of his early productions? done in Bourne. That was uh, Laura Garner started a theater down there. On no, Trump no, Road. actually, I, did, I didn't know about that one. Hmm. Wow. Pretty exciting times. Yes. You know, I, I mean, it just, it, as I was writing the book, it, it would be amazing. I would pull a string and um, with, with a new fact and all of a sudden 12 new facts would would suddenly reveal them uh, themselves 12 new theater companies or or people who had been in theater or some fact that i needed to know and so i'm i'm sure that i've missed some things along the way but i love hearing about that i i guess i'll absolutely have to do a um um a f final notes or a second version mm -hmm. of it to yeah. include all of these things. It's great to hear. And I was just wondering if there's anything else you can tell us about doing the research and the process. About doing the research? Well, it took me about six months to do the research and then about a year to write. So altogether, it was about a year and a half. And, and actually museums were, were wonderful and historical societies in, in talking to me. Um, Provincetown Museum was absolutely great. They have a permanent theater exhibit uh, focusing on the Provincetown players and the early wharf theaters. And so there were a number, number of historians there who spoke to me. And then actually the Falmouth Historical Society, they opened their archives to me. They were absolutely wonderful in um, in showing me the the old archival material they had and and talking about their theater in Falmouth um, at the turn of the century and beyond and so I had a lot of help from those people and then a number of as I noticed his as I mentioned historians like Evelyn Lawson 
And then there is a book um, about the uh, Cape Playhouse and some books about Monomoy and I used, used all of those. And then I talked to a lot of theater families and there are so many families, so many theaters that have involvement from multi-generations of families. Mm -hmm. and, and they were so lovely in sharing personal stories about things that had happened when they were, some of them were, were growing up in the theater and um, told me about their lives, what that was like. And, wow. and so I've included those in the book and they were wonderful because it, it gave it sort of a personal feel uh -huh. to get the background of what was really going on backstage. Oh, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> Good. Good. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming. And thank you so much, Sue, for volunteering your time to come and give this oh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, this Thank was a reschedule. You. She was going to come here in person. What was it in June, I think, or May? You had something scheduled. I think so. And then, so, right. Doing this instead. <laughs> but I'm so glad we got to do this. And yes. I, and once I, ha what, once I have this up, I will even send an email out to you guys because I have everyone's email letting you know. Okay. All right. Have a great right. day, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye -bye. So nice to see you all. Thank you. You too. Take care. Thanks, Sue.